ready so, when you are. Right, thank you very much, Nick. And thank you so much, Domenica. I couldn't agree with you more about the human body being such the most amazing machine. So what I'm hoping to do tonight is just give you just a tiny little insight into perhaps that user manual, which if only we'd had at the beginning would have made such a difference. So I'm delighted to be talking to you tonight on the topic of nutrition, but there's a couple of things that I'd like you to know first of all. And that is that I am not an expert. I have no qualifications in the subject. The topic is vast, so I cannot condense even a minute part of the diverse knowledge and information that we have into 20 minutes. So what you're going to hear is my take on the subject, which comes from 30 years of interest and curiosity from a personal point of view. A wonder at the complexity of the human body and also horror at how we've managed to get ourselves in the Western world, our so-called advanced civilization, in this mess of ill health. That's because of what we have done to our food and the way that we produce and market it. So many of you could well be more knowledgeable than I and maybe have a different perspective on it. But my intention is just to raise awareness, if you need it, on a few specific topics just to whet your appetite and to highlight a few myths, misunderstandings and some downright lies that we've been fed. And finally, to give you some fairly simple ways to make better choices about what we put into our bodies. Now, I'm not going to be giving you any specific advice on the way you should eat, whether you should be vegan, vegetarian, any other uh, type of, of, of Aryan, because what you eat depends on what your body needs. And you know that better than anybody else. So what I'm after is perhaps some, some ideas about how you can have some fairly simple ways to make better choices about what we and you put into your, your bodies. And at the end, I'll give you a reading list. It's not specific references. These are rather just a few of the sources that I've read over the years, which have guided my thinking. And together with a professional interest as a dentist in the role of sugar in dental health, and also what I've learnt in a part time course in nutrition a few years ago. So where do we begin? Perhaps we could begin at the beginning. So the question that I ask myself nowadays, given that we haven't evolved much since we were hunter gatherers, would this make sense to the digestive system of a hunter gatherer? If you could find it, pick it, catch it, kill it and maybe cook it, then you could eat it. But that took a huge amount of energy. And nowadays we hunt the aisles of the supermarket at any time of the day or night, gather into our trolleys all manner of processed, pre-packed and preserved food. What this does to our planet is a topic for another day. But our digestive processes haven't changed very much, if at all, since our hunter-gatherer days. And modern man is believed to have been around for two to three hundred thousand years, but it's only 15,000 years or so since we began domesticating animals. And it's only around 10,000 years since we stopped being nomads and began growing grains. And even that, sorry guys, where's the move on? There we go. So that 10,000 years is a tiny amount of time for our, bio, our biochemistry to adapt to the way that our intelligence and creativity has manipulated what we can do and do now put into our mouths, let alone what it's done in the last 100 years or so. 
So our modern grains are really not like the grains that we originally cultivated 10,000 years ago. They've got a lot more gluten in and it's a very difficult for our digestive system to digest those grains. Some people can't digest them at all. It's to do with the way that the that protein, the, the gliadin in the gluten is very, very difficult to digest. And the one enzyme that we've got that can digest it is actually meant to do something else in the body to do with anti-inflammatory processes. And so it has a hard time. So if you find that you do better by not eating grains, then you don't need to eat them. They are optional. That's the first thing. So as a hunter gatherer, we would have come across sweet things. Not very often. It would have been limited honey from the odd bees nest that you came across and had to do battle with the bees to get. So your diet would have been limited to what was around you and to the season. And you'd have thrived, well, most of the time anyway, or we wouldn't be here now. So what has happened? Myths, misunderstanding and misdirections have resulted from ignorance, poor science, big business and big advertising, massive food processing to produce cheap, poor quality food and big profits for the food, drink and sugar industries. There's hidden agendas, vested interests, elephants in the room so that we now have a massive juggernaut that the powers that be are powerless and unwilling to turn around. And our medical profession is not taught what is good nutrition. Something like 10 to 24 hours in a six year course. I'm now going to mention two big culprits to my mind in the reason why we're here now. These are Mr. Kellogg and Dr. Keyes. Now the Kellogg brothers, this is the story of cornflakes. And back in the early 20th century, there were two Kellogg brothers and they had a spa somewhere in uh, America, I believe near Chicago. And Mr. Kellogg had a big thing about what people were eating for breakfast. And he decided that they should eat grains. To cut a long story short, what he came up with was a byproduct, I believe, from animal feed, which were cornflakes, and he processed them to make something for his clients in his spa called cornflakes. Now, they weren't very appetizing, but then his brother, who was rather more uh, entrepreneurial, perhaps, than the first Dr. Kellogg, Mr. Kellogg, decided that if he added sugar to them, it would become more palatable. And this is precisely what he did. Others then got onto this bandwagon and by producing different cereals and adding more sugar, they were in competition. So they managed to convince the public that A, breakfast was necessary, and if we've got time, we'll come to that later, and that it should be cereal. So competition dictated that more and more sugar was necessary to make it even more palatable and win market share. Now, given that we are programmed to like sweet tastes, it went from there. So I did a little bit of research and I couldn't go to my cupboards for this because I didn't have any of this in my cupboards. But this is my my son and his family. Now they have a very healthy lifestyle 
and this was the best I could do from their cupboards. So we have here a breakfast cereal which is simply granola with a hint of honey. Natural ingredients, lowers cholesterol. Now wouldn't you think that was great? However, A 45 gram portion of this is that size. That is meant to be one helping of this stuff. And if you look at the nutritional information here, you see that in one 45 gram portion, there are 8.5 grams of sugar. That is two teaspoons. You'll see up in the ingredients as well, that we have sugar listed as the second ingredient and honey as the fourth ingredient. Now, as far as your body's concerned, honey is sugar. So that makes the total sugar in that really quite high. This was the other packet in the cupboard. Cheerios, five whole grains, fiber. Nine vitamins, no artificial colours or flavours, source of calcium. And in this one, a 30 gram portion contains five grams of sugar or one teaspoon. So sugar, the real baddie, in my opinion. If you fancy it, there is a wonderful YouTube video by Robert Lustig. It is 90 minutes, it's 2009, and it's called The Bitter Truth. And this is well worth a look if you want the background on big sugar, what sugar does to the body. One sixth of the calories consumed in the Western world are refined sugar. It's completely unnecessary for human nutrition. It's empty calories. It's implicated in obesity, type two diabetes, heart disease, and of course, tooth decay. Yet we consume several hundred times more now than we ever used to before industrialization. Big business and advertising, why? As an additive, it's cheap. It acts as a preservative, it adds bulk, and it mitigates the unpalatableness of low fat food, where fat has been artificially reduced in processed and refined foods to meet the low fat lobby. So here's just a few examples of where you might find sugar, where you might not expect to. Uh, this is um, tomato ketchup. We have got a yogurt, yogurt is healthy, not unless it's plain. In bread, Snapple, is that kind of some kind of drink, I think, I'm not sure. Just an example of where there is hidden sugar. The other thing to be aware of is that sugar has, I think it's 49 different names that you might see on your ingredients. And the thing is that they can list each one individually. So because you have to put the ingredients in order of the quantity in them, remember to add up all the different sugars that you might see on your list before you decide if that's something you want to put in your supermarket trolley. So reduce sugar whenever you can, read the labels and don't believe natural this, reduce this or the other. So the other K that we talked about was Ansel Keys. You may have heard of him, he is quite famous. He was an American biologist and physiologist who carried out what is called the seven country study of diet and heart disease. Now this was an observational study that was carried out, uh, I think between about 1950 and the 70s. And the way that he put his results over it purported to show that a high saturated fat diet caused heart disease and was the basis for the long 
and still entrenched belief that a low fat diet was the way to a healthy heart and a healthy life. And the low fat mantra was embraced by the food manufacturers and the advertisers. Fat was replaced by even more sugar. But the problem was that Keyes was wrong. It was an observational study only. And he'd started off with 22 countries, but he simply left out the ones that didn't fit his theory. But food manufacturers had a field day and they reduced the fat adding sugar to improve the palatability of the so-called food. Marketing it as healthy, but we need fat in our bodies. Our brains are 60% fat and every single cell wall is composed of fat molecules, which when the right fats are consumed, allows nutrients and hormones to pass in and out of the cell. So we need saturated fats and healthy omega-3 fats. So there was not only no correlation between his theory and uh, his, his study, he also incorrectly identified the bad fat, saying that it was saturated fat, and promoted the processed vegetable oils, which can't make healthy cell walls. So I go back to my hunter-gatherer point of view. Any fat would have occurred naturally in the diet, eaten as saturated fats from animals and healthy unsaturated fats from fish and seeds, all unprocessed. So what do we do nowadays uh, to, or what can you do uh, to make sure that the fat that you're getting is healthy? If you want an oil or a fat, then use butter, extra virgin oil, olive oil, which isn't processed, or coconut oil, again, not processed. The next really interesting thing to just talk about briefly is your gut biome. Now, this is relatively new news. I know there's been quite a bit about it uh, in the last couple of years, but we're only just beginning to understand how vital our gut biome is to our health, our well-being, our uh, mental health, and to how it works. We really don't have a clue. We're only just scratching the surface of how this works. But we do know that creating a healthy gut biome is of critical importance. We have far fewer bacteria in our gut now than we used to when we had a much more diverse diet, when our soil was healthy, when it hadn't been denatured by intensive farming. So it's much more difficult now to have that be healthy. There are ways that you can do it. I can't go into too much detail with it at the moment, but I wouldn't be tempted to go for probiotics, which is putting bacteria into your gut. By the time it's got through your stomach, which is very acid, and down into your gut, uh, there may not be much left and they may not be the ones that suit you. The better way is to feed your own gut biome. And you can do that with prebiotics. This is the food that your bacteria need. When you're eating, you're feeding your bacteria, not just you. So to do that, it is things like soluble fiber, vegetables, a great variation, variety of different vegetables. Don't keep eating the same ones. Have fermented foods, live foods, plain yogurt, plain live yogurt, cheese, cider vinegar, sauerkraut, kimchi, that kind of thing to feed your gut biome. And the last thing that I wanted to come on to if we, and I think we've just about got time for that. Do you need breakfast? This is another really interesting topic now is intermittent fasting or time restricted eating. Again, I'm going to blame Dr. Kellogg for this, saying that you need breakfast, you need to eat three meals a day plus snacks. The food industry wants you to eat three meals a day plus snacks, but do you need it? The answer is no, you don't. 
it's only relatively recently that we have been told that we need to eat as soon as we get up. About two years ago, I decided to give this a try. And I find I don't need to eat until maybe one, two o'clock in the afternoon. I have a coffee, that does the trick. But you don't. If you can restrict, give yourself a longer time where your gut's not needing to digest, then you will feel the better for it, I promise you. So that is bringing me just about to the end of my time. I'm now going to give you, I say this is your reading list. This is not references as such because, but if you're interested, want to find out more, these are some of the books that you can go to and read. They really are eye-opening. This last one by Tim Spector, Spoon Fed, is uh, this year. He's the guy who is running the Zoe um, app and um, research on COVID. So this guy is right up to date and really well worth a read. So with that, I will come to an end and hand back to our convener tonight. Over to you, Nick. Okay, absolutely wonderful.